Hey, good morning, everybody. Hey, hey. It's our regular live stream Wiggle Wednesday here. Uh, we're going to be talking about protein poisoning today. We'll give you just a few seconds to see if some more people want to join us here. Uh, just for one announcement, the NC State Vermiculture Conference is coming up. Just to remind everyone, I'm sure a lot of people here have already heard about it, but uh, it's October 22nd and 23rd at the NC State uh, University. Uh, if you register by 20, September 22nd, you save, uh, it's $300 versus $350 for uh, other registration, but uh, it's on or in person this year, as well as they're offering a online version. So you can attend online if you're not able to travel. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and post the, uh, post the link here in the chat, um, the comments and then, uh, yeah. So the NC state one is really good. If you've got any interest in anything beyond the hobby level, Going to the NC State Vermiculture Conference is, is awesome. It's uh, it's educational. Pardon the uh, airplane sounds overhead. I live right near an airport, so, you know, sorry. <laughs> but uh, the other thing, too, is there is a worm business conference where if you're interested in not just beyond the hobby level, but if you're interested in actually starting a business out of uh, vermiculture, vermicomposting, um that is another good one. It's a little more hands-on. That's out in Phoenix, Arizona at the Arizona Worm Farm. I mean, both of these events are great. Uh, the Arizona Worm Farm one's a much more hands-on, uh, but it's it's uh, it's it was a lot of fun, and I think a lot of people got a lot of value out of that. So uh, Troy will be speaking. I'm putting the link in here. Troy's going to be speaking at the NC State Vermiculture Conference. And then I'll be speaking out at the uh, Worm Business Conference there in Arizona in January. So uh, I think the both of us will probably be in both locations. So come out and I'll, I'll buy you a beer. So let's see. We got to who we got on here. We got Peter. We got uh, No Dig Gardener from, I think it was No Dig Gardener from, where are you from? UK? Yes. UK, yeah. I was thinking it was Ireland. Yep. K Borum from uh, St. Charles, Missouri. Um, and uh, let's see, Roger from Metcalf. So, yep. <clears throat> All right. So we'll just give a couple more minutes here. Looks like we got 30 or 40 folks on um, here. We're both simulcasting here on uh, YouTube and uh, on Facebook. So a few more, a few more trickling in. Um, let's see who else we got. Okay, Forum. Southern Vermont, South Yorkshire, England. South, okay, all cool. right. We got on the rocks in the soil, Michael Godbold. How's it going, Michael? All right, cool. Um, I tell you, Troy, Susan. go ahead and get. What's that? I uh, heard she said it's yeah. Susan. If that makes it easier, I said, "Hey, Susan." Susan, yeah, yeah, that makes and it easier. Somebody from right here in Westchester, PA. Yeah. Hey, Dave. David out in Utah. Cool. It's good to see you guys. Awesome. All right. Um, so, uh, Troy, I'd say go ahead and get started here, and we'll uh, we'll do a little bit of stuff on the protein poisoning, like we talked about, and then we'll just uh, open up the floor for uh, for a Q and A. Yeah, I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Is it sharing it? It's not sharing it yet. No. Okay. I, for some reason, it wasn't wanting to click on the share. Hey, Brent from Albuquerque. What's up, Grant? It's good to see you again. Got there, Michael in uh, Northern Idaho. Yep. All right. You're sharing, Troy. All right. Here we go. Let me get rid of the banner here so everybody can see it. Uh, let's see here, the brand thing there, and all right, cool. Take it all away. Right, so today we are talking about protein poisoning. It's also known as sour crop. Uh, both of these are kind of interesting terms. That I don't know exactly. I was trying to think of a name. If I were to come up a name with a name for this condition, what I would call it, and I was having an issue trying to figure it out. Uh, 
But anyway, protein poisoning or sauerkraut is a deadly condition with worms. It's caused by acidic conditions and fermentation within a bin. And we'll get into the details of how this works in the next few slides here. We're going to go through diagnosing protein poisoning in worms. Uh, so learning uh, what you're looking for uh, when you start to have a problem with your worms, the cause of protein poisoning, and then correcting the root cause. And then we'll have a Q&A on protein poisoning or whatever other uh, worm questions that you may have. So protein poisoning is also known as string of pearls. And you can see in this picture here why it would take on the name string of pearls. Um, the worms are going to, I believe it starts off with some discoloration. Um, if, if you have some discoloration in your worms, I wouldn't necessarily you know, start to freak out, but uh, that's likely the start of it. And then you're gonna start to see lumpy and deformed body shapes. Uh, like here, you'll see the uh, bloated sections of a worm and we'll learn how that comes about. But I mean, this is quite obvious. If you're seeing with this with your worms, you're gonna know right away what's going on. So if you're seeing things that are similar to this, you know you're dealing with protein poisoning. Um, this can also cause your worms to, sections of your worms to break off. Or if you're also noticing dead worms, that's gonna be a likely cause. Or if you're seeing broken and dead worms, I should say. Um, and then also you're going to likely notice some nasty odors. So this is coming about as a result of anaerobic conditions and anaerobicity in compost or a worm bin is normally causing some nasty smells. Um, you might be smelling some ammonia smell or a sulfur smell, or uh, especially if you're having using grains, that's what happens or, or that's... Uh, a lot of times the cause of this is when people are using more grain food. Uh, so you might just smell like a beer or wine smell because that's what fermenting grain smells like. So what is the cause of this protein poisoning? Um, it's a result of an imbalance of foods and bedding within your bin, which is causing acidic conditions. So if you overfeed a bin and just continue putting food in without letting your worms completely work through it, or if you're adding food scraps or you know green material that's high in nitrogen without adding adequate carbonaceous material you're going to get an imbalance there and especially with food scraps um, or if you're adding water with a high protein diet uh, it's going to start to get anaerobic and then you're going to start to ferment so uh, you've got high protein foods or which would also be high nitrogen uh, ratio to carbohydrates in your material that's going to cause anaerobic conditions and then anaerobic bacteria and fungi when they uh, when things go anaerobic and you start to get anaerobic bacteria and fungi what they the enzymes that they use to break down materials and consume things are going to be more acidic so that's going to lower your ph so the more anaerobic you're going the lower your ph is going so this uh, anaerobic conditions and absence of oxygen is also causing fermentation. I think a lot of people are uh, know what fermentation is or what happens during fermentation, but worms then are going to consume fermented food or they're consuming food that uh, is under these anaerobic conditions and then it's fermenting within them and that's what's causing this. So worms have calciferous glands inside of them in their crop. Uh, the food they process food through their crop and their gizzard, and it goes through a calciferous gland, gland which is going to be neutralizing acidic foods that they eat uh, before it hits their digestive system. But if something's too acidic, it's not able to neutralize it, and then it's gonna end up fermenting within their system. So uh, fermentation is when bacteria and yeast convert carbohydrates into carbon dioxide. Um, think of how bubbly a beer is when you pour it or some kombuchas or if you make sauerkraut you'll see the gases forming within sauerkraut um, and then same thing if you were to have this happen within a worm you're getting gas this worms are eating food that's fermenting within them building up gas and then you know worms aren't able to burp or fart to, so like humans so they're not able to release this so you've got a buildup of gas that's been causing these malformations so you can see from that picture of the uh, string of pearls worm there 
you know, how this would cause this rupturing and bloating of certain sections within the worm. It's not something, it's not like an illness that can be transmitted from worm to worm. So some worms may be afflicted. It's just the worms who may have eaten fermented foods or these acidic foods. Uh, so it's not something that's going to be passed from worm to worm that you need to be worried about. But if you have afflicted worms, they, they're not able to going to be saved. You can't, you know, give them CPR or squeeze them to get the gas out or anything like that. They are going to eventually die. Um, and then most reported cases of this come from worm farmers who are feeding grains or commercial worm feed. So if you think of grains, um, I'm just kind of drawing a blank all of a sudden. I was trying to think of some, but uh, fermented grains is alcohol. So uh, alcohol is not good. Beer is not good. You don't want your worms consuming any type of things like that. So how do you correct uh, any conditions that are going to be causing protein poisoning within your worms. Uh, first thing you want to do is to get the uh, ratios of foods and bedding fixed. So you want to uh, re remedy these anaerobic conditions. Um, what I labeled here as the Band-Aid approach is you can add some type of alkaline substance like ground eggshells or agricultural lime, uh, calcium carbonate. That's what Tums is made out of. Tums is an antacid and we're trying to you know, have the opposite of an acid here. So this is something, you know, if you were to have conditions that were uh, acidic and bringing about protein poisoning, this is going to help fix that. But in the future, it's not like you would want to continuously be having to use an alkaline substance because it means that you're, you've got anaerobic conditions in your bin, which are, are not going to be good. So you want to remedy those anaerobic conditions by, uh, getting out any remove any of the uneaten food that would be fermenting so if you can you can tell by the smell normally or the look of gross stuff in your worm bin um, so get any of that stuff out and then if it's still wet and goopy you want to add some ripped up paper or shredded leaves uh shredded cardboard any type of carb carbonaceous material that's gonna balance out the uh anaerobic conditions in there uh, you're likely going to want to put that stuff in dry so it can soak up some of the moisture to and also add some porosity so that you've got your worm airflow going through your worm bin there. And hey, then, Troy, real fast, real fast, man. Can you can you hide the little sharing banner that's it's covering right. up part of your there you go. I thought Thanks. that was yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm just sorry. into my talk here. <laughs> so then uh, in the future, when you're adding foods you want to aim for a two to one ratio of browns to greens. So if you're chopping up your carrots and making a salad for the night and you've got your leftover scraps and you're tossing that into your worm bin, you want to put in twice as much brown material as you do green material when you're introducing that into your worm bin. And then along with that, you want to make sure that your worms are consuming. This is especially important all the time uh, for anything. You want to make sure that your worms are consuming all the foods that you're adding in there. So when you're putting foods into a worm bin, uh, for most cases of management styles for worm bins, uh, you want to add, you know, maybe half an inch to one inch of food. If at a time, um, if you know that you've got a lot of worms that are super active and they can shoot through that, that in, you know, less than a couple of days, you can add, you know, maybe an inch and a half or two inches, but not, I wouldn't say more than like two inches when you're not on a commercial scale. And then you wanna give the worms at least a few days to work through that material so that they're able to chew through it and let microbes break down the scraps that you have in there and then before adding more food. So if you keep adding food and adding food and get this sloppy, nasty, wet stuff that's in there that's not getting worked through, that's gonna bring about these anaerobic conditions that uh, bring about nasty protein poisoning or other pests and insects in your bin. And I think that's about it. So any questions on that? Cool. There's, or, there's a couple, other couple, yeah, a couple things I want to touch on here real fast. If you want to unshare there um, is that, so you first asked, <laughs> this is just funny. You first asked like, what what could I name this other than protein poisoning or sauerkraut? If, if anybody has seen SNL from a long time ago, the commercials they had, one of them was called Colon Blow, which was this, <laughs> which is this thing that had all this fiber that just destroyed the insides of so basically delivered the same fiber as 
you know, a thousand bowls of the leading brand. So I think uh, calling uh, protein poisoning colon blow would be a, a good idea for worms. Um, so the, the main thing here, and, and you touched on it, but I want to hit it again, is that is that you want to treat the cause and not the symptom. So sure, adding lime will should increase the pH, but the problem is, is you've got a low pH because you overfed and didn't add enough of that bedding. So make sure that you're treating the cause of protein poisoning and not treating just the symptoms of it and kind of masking, masking the symptoms. Um, so that cause, the cause of almost any problem, and here's the thing, I, I could just do a post on, of course, we've done a post on like problems in the worm bin. The biggest, the thing most of them have in common is that people just overfed. They didn't add enough of that boring carbonaceous material like paper, cardboard, leaves, all that stuff that's not sexy to look at because worms don't swarm it like they do, you know, cantaloupe and watermelon and stuff like that. You want to add a lot of that stuff to prevent these problems in the first place. Almost any worm bin problem can be fixed by stop feeding, add bedding, and don't touch your bin for two weeks. I, it's like just full stop. So um, that's the main that's the main point that that I wanted to stress on this today is that these things are caused by overfeeding and and just treat the sim treat the cause of the issue, and and not the symptom. So I've got uh, uh, yep cocoa cocoa core there, Greg. You're right. Uh, cocoa core is another kind of carbon carbonaceous material. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna. Uh, go through some stuff that came in here, Troy, and we'll we'll handle some of these. One of them is really good, and this is from Jim. He asks if feeding Bokashi compost to the worms would cause this condition. So, if anybody's not familiar with Bokashi, it's a it's an anaerobic form of composting that creates fermentation. Really, it creates a very acidic uh, acidic uh, uh, material when it's over with, and it can have have a fairly potent sm smell by itself. Here's the book answer should be that you want to keep things aerobic and not terribly acidic. But the people that I've heard that use Bokashi, they sort of Bokashi something and then feed it to the worms. They say that the worms love it. And I think that over time that stuff becomes less, less anaerobic as it gets exposed to the air. Uh, so Jim, I would think the book answer here is yes, but if you are otherwise maintaining your bin with a lot of bedding and all that other good material, I think that you probably could, feed Bokashi compost to the worms and not have protein poisoning. Uh, Grant was talking to somebody, he was mentioning that, and it's, this is true, that if you've got these worms in your bin that are suffering from colon blow, uh, then, then you know, they're going to die and then mites are going to clean them up anyway, if, if you've got mites. I mean, you don't really need to re remove dead worms from a bin no. uh, in most cases, but, uh, but if you're, you know, alarmed by seeing them, then maybe that's the, that's the best thing. Um, Kelly asked, uh, how, how to keep roaches and other bugs out. It's a little bit unrelated, but we're in the open Q and a, so fire away. Um, so it's hard to keep them out of a bin. You know, your worm bin is a, is an ecosystem and it's hard to make conditions that are attractive to worms that are not also attractive to other critters. And, I would say protect it vertically. Um, this is one of the reasons why this isn't an urban worm bag pitch, but it's a pitch is that it's elevated off the ground. And so it, it's a harder target for roaches to get into because you're, you, you know, you don't have something that's, that's on the ground. However, roaches will climb and kind of get where they want. So uh, somebody mentioned here too, is that you can use diatomaceous earth to, for those hard shelled pests. I'm not hundred percent sure if they work on roaches, but you can use a food grade diatomaceous earth to sprinkle over the top of your vermicompost. And that isn't going to keep them out, but it's going to kill them once they get inside. Um, so real fast here, Kelly also asks, uh, she said, I live in Florida and my worms are outside and it rains a lot. So they try to get out while I have, while I have the bin covered. The interesting thing here is that, is that when you have when you have the bin covered, there's a couple things that happen. One is condensation that you have on the walls and on the top of your bin. Worms love condensation, so climbing the walls is not really an issue because the worms are just happy in moisture. They like the condensation. The one thing I will tell you is that when it rains, especially in a place like Florida where you get thunderstorms like literally every day, with the onset of a thunderstorm, you get a drop in barometric pressure. 
and uh, worms, especially Indian blue composting worms, which are often mixed in with red wigglers, uh, unfortunately, are very susceptible to this drop in barometric pressure. And for some reason, this particular breed of worms just sort of freaks out and then just tries to leave the bin. Uh, so it's it's kind of a it's kind of a, an annoyance, but it's also it doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong or you can do anything to um, to fix it really. Um, uh, Powell, Powell, Powell or Powell from uh, Germany says he was sent sent you know a pound of worms uh, on the two hottest days in Germany, and he was saying the smell when they arrived was was atrocious. That was not protein poisoning. That was just mass flesh death of of worms. Um, I will say we're we're in the dog days of summer here. Uh, my partner farm Mimi's Mimi's Worms in uh, in Valdosta, Georgia. Currently, she doesn't like to ship if temperatures are approaching 100 um, or in Georgia or wherever they're going. But the, the one thing about the worms, you want to make sure that you're uh, that you've got an experienced uh, worm shipper that's sort of done this before. If you are ordering in July or August, because it's, it's real tricky. You, they have to ship the worms in a dry peat moss to reduce the microbial activity uh, in the, in the worm bins. So, Anyway, just know know who you're getting your your worms from. So, um, Troy, I don't know if you've been tracking any of the uh, other other uh, questions that came in. Um, but somebody uh, asked about adding biochar to a worm bin. Um, I would say adding a tiny bit of biochar, maybe five to ten percent of the bin would be okay. But um, yeah, you wouldn't want to get too much, and be careful with the dust from the uh, biochar as well yeah. and also uh you'd want to be also if you're making biochar and it happened to be like with a bunch of ash as well be careful with the ash because that can be salty which would uh affect the worms and the mite their moisture they wouldn't want to get up against the ash yeah um someone mentioned about flies maggots keeping flies and maggots out um again that's like keeping a cover on or a keeping a cover of dry bedding over everything on the top will help to keep flies, maggots, or any type of pest problems down. Um, I was going to mention with the Bokashi, yeah, if you were to take all Bokashi and feed, like just start out with nothing boca but Bokashi stuff, that might be an issue. But if you've got worm compost that you're kind of diluting the Bokashi down into the worm compost, you're going to have those aerobic microorganisms take over the anaerobes or you could let it sit out for a few days in the air and the aerobic microorganisms will start to take over. But I wouldn't think it would be, I mean, it hasn't, obviously it has not caused issues for people to directly feed Bokashi to uh, worm bins, but I would be aware if it was super smelly and nasty to not put it in there. Mm -hmm. um, Greg from the uh, Urban Farm Podcast, I'll be going on there here in a couple weeks, but uh, he, he chimed in and said that, you know, biochar is not worm food, so maybe just add it to your garden. So a couple, couple points on that. Yes, biochar is definitely not worm food, but what it is is it acts like a magnet for microbes and microbes and nutrients. It's positively, ch negatively charged, so it, it attracts those positively charged nutrients um, to to the biochar and it acts as a safe haven for all the microbes. You can actually really boost your micro population uh, by adding biochar to the worm bin. It can also be used as grit for the worms because it's not going to break down in their guts. And it, it can be one of those things where if the particle sizes are small enough, uh, that biochar, the, the biochar, if there is that dust and not those large chunks, the worms can use those as grit. The other thing, too about biochar in the garden is you want to make sure that it's it's been inoculated with microbes or charged and by charged it means had been steeped in something that is going to add the nutrients to it because if you put raw biochar in a garden uh if you put raw biochar in a garden it's going to act as a as a giant magnet for uh for nutrients and microbes and actually cause negative effects in your garden for a couple growing seasons until those you know what's going to happen is all of those 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 microbes and nutrients are going to be attracted to the biochar which is going to take them away from the plants but then over time they're going to slowly start releasing them back into the uh into the soil so 
that's two points on biochar. I love the concept of biochar. I really haven't played with it too much. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to be buying a biochar maker here. It's going to be customized for urban worm. So we'll be taking some fun pictures of that. It's just going to be a, a small kind of almost like a solo stove. Uh, so I'll be making some of that and hopefully documenting it uh, for you guys. So, all right, I've been blabbing long enough. Who, who else we got? I wasn't seeing any other questions. Uh, there might be some before that I missed. Yeah, we got uh, snails. Andy is asking about snails. Um, yellow sea snail looking things, are they bad? I don't know if they're, I'm not sure if they're bad per se, but uh, I don't know. Do, do you know anything about snails and do they peacefully coexist with worms? I would imagine they do. Um, they should peacefully coexist with worms. Um, I haven't looked into snails as much. Uh, yeah, that they don't usually meet up in that way, uh, but I'll check into that and uh, I can get back to people in the future. Okay, cool, cool. Um, anybody else has got anything here? Um, let us know. Uh, we've been out it a little while, but uh, it's a, it was a fairly short presentation for us. Um, Someone, sorry. Someone asked about adding acidic foods. So um, if you were to dump a bunch of, well, it depends on the acidic food. Um, if you were to put a large, large amount of something, some type of acidic food into your bin, it would likely cause problems. But most people, I mean, that would be a type of place where you're on like a commercial scale and you're getting like a huge amount of citrus from a, a juice place or something like that. And on a home scale, you're not like likely to have too much. Um, there is, I believe it's linoleic acid that's in oranges um, actually is harmful to worms. So it's not like you don't want to put orange peels into your, into your worm bin. Um, just kind of keep it to a minimum every time you add, but you know, microbes are going to break down that at those acids and then it'll be safe for your worms to come in and they won't be harmed or anything like that. Same with onion. Well, onions, people worry about that's not necessarily acidic, but, you know, you don't have to worry about putting onions in your bin. You can put, you know, some onion scraps in your bin without harming worms. Uh, it's just when you get an overload of acidic foods um, in, you know, too much of a concentrated amount in one feeding or whatever. Uh, somebody asked about tilling the bin. I it's the only time you would really want to go through and till your bin or turn it over would be if you had some like large anaerobic pockets. If you were to notice a smell and dig down and you notice it's anaerobic, I would yes, you know, pull that up, um, add some cocoa peat or ripped up paper or something like that, add that in and mix it up. Um your worms much prefer having a home environment where they're not getting tossed about and they can just be left at peace. But if you're improving their environment by disrupting their lives, then, you know, you're helping them out in the long run. Otherwise, you know, just leave them alone. Okay. Uh, so Michael from uh, Alpenworm, I believe it's Michael uh, in Austria. This is an interesting question. He was asking about um, the opinion on peat moss causing protein poisoning. He said, it's no matter what, if you keep it neutral with lime or not, after three weeks, the worms start to get protein poisoning. Now, so Mike, in America, we would get our peat moss from, if, if you're using peat moss, and there's reasons not to, but if you're, you are using peat moss, it's typically coming from the northern U.S. or Canada. Uh, in, in, uh, in Europe, you'd likely be getting it from what I think to be Eastern Europe. Now, this is an interesting thing. There is a, a, a large Australian worm farmer called, uh, at Kookaburra Worm Farms named George Mingan. He, was, he used peat moss, but then he changed his peat moss uh, source to a place that was sourced out of Eastern Europe. So I think he was bringing the stuff over by sea or something like that, because I don't know if there are any natural like peat moss sources in Australia. It was a new source, and he ended up losing over fifty thousand dollars worth of worms in a single weekend because of bad peat moss. So that's probably a reason not to use it if you don't know what the source is. Um, but yeah, I don't, Michael. I don't think that that's really an issue for most people. But again, I can't, I can't claim to to know the quality of sources for for every for everyone out there. Um, so uh, let's see here. 
Um, Kelly asked what protein poisoning in. Kelly, if you want to check back on the YouTube channel and get the link for this same video and just watch it over since uh, you came in late, we already went over all that stuff, but you can watch it after this and uh, learn all that you need to know. Yeah. It's basically, Kelly, it's when it's when you've got too low of a pH and, and things start fermenting inside your, your worm's guts and it basically blows it up from the from the inside, or as we call it, colon blow for worms. I'm going to keep using that over and over again. I, I, got, a, I got a few more times in me. Um, so here, a couple other things. Somebody's actually moving close by to uh, some guy named this guy here on YouTube. Says he's moving close to Mimi's Worms there in Valdosta, Georgia. And he asks if you can visit the location in person or only order it delivered. Right now, it's only for delivery. Um, so with this farm, uh, we – it's – we're not ready, nor are we insured for people coming on site uh, for tours or whatnot. But at some point, uh, and I say we because I, I basically we we own kind of that property with with Samantha there at Mimi's Worms. Uh, she will uh, eventually open it up to things like workshops and in-person tours. Uh, but for the meantime, it's pretty much just to order for delivery. And she's also very busy. So th this is what happens all the time is somebody talks wants to talk to you about worms you think it's going to be a five minute conversation next thing you know you both enjoy talking about it so it's an hour later and you know she's running a business out of there so uh it'd be tough for her to give a tour as busy as she's been this year um but anyway uh yeah i hope you're not moving to valdosta right now because i would think it's pretty damn miserable down there it's, it's miserable here in philadelphia right now but uh, uh valdosta is is even worse um so uh uh, Kelly asked what the best worm food is. That's, that's a tough question. That's a big question. Um, really Kelly, you want to stay away from anything that's meat and dairy, uh, worms love, uh, they love cantaloupe. They love watermelon, anything in the cucurbit, uh, family of, of foods. They absolutely love, um, broccoli is good. Cauliflower is good. Just, just no meat and no dairy or very little meat, and very little dairy. Um, but there's not a single there's not a single one one good answer there. Um, so let's see here. Um, yeah, we had a couple spammers here. Uh, somebody, yeah, <laughs> I I I, lo I don't know how the bots find this channel. We're not that big here that we find bots that start posting stuff about oh. naked people and naked people uh. and Vladimir Putin. But uh, anyway um gonna block them so let's see here um all right uh cousins talks about uh check out gardening in canada for a better understanding about the viability of peat um uh, most of us most of what a lot of us know is not the truth here's the thing with peat is peat is peat is considered kind of a non-renewable resource as it's kind of pulled from the ground um, it's, it's, it's almost considered to be mined. Um, and so it's not something that is a waste byproduct of something else like coconut core, uh, but which is, which is the byproduct of kind of coconut production and harvesting. Um, but so peat moss is not considered to be a very sustainable product. Although I would say that I, I think that I can I can find a case to defend its use in some cases because some places are getting an, uh, excavated, for instance, uh, for renovations, and a lot of peat gets pulled from those places, and so that stuff's got to go somewhere. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to stay in the ground if it's it, it, you know it's. I'm just saying that if a, if you've got new construction somewhere, uh, big development, and say whatever you want about development and overdevelopment, that's fine, but that that dirt is going to go somewhere. So sometimes uh, that is a good source uh, for, for peat moss. So um, anyway, uh, cool. Hey, thanks for checking in from Las Vegas there, Patrick. Um, if anybody's got anything else or if they've got any suggested topics, one of the things that's a bit of a challenge, I don't say a challenge for us is like, okay, what do we talk about for the next one? And so we've got some ideas already, but if, if there are things that you guys want to hear about, um, on future live streams, uh, Troy will cover it or the both of us will cover it every now and then I'll be doing one of these, uh, solo myself. Um, but, uh, if there's anything you guys want to see, you know, let us know here in the comments and, uh, and we'll, we'll make it happen. Um, 
So with that, um, cool. Hey, Susan. Um, all right. With that, let's uh, let's maybe wrap it up. We're gonna be uh, doing this again. Troy. Troy is uh, possibly gonna be going to Jamaica for uh, a, a USAID related um, kind of outreach mission to help with soil issues in Jamaica. Troy, are you able to, do you want to say anything about that? I've got to mute myself because of this airplane. Um, just from what I know, it involves vermicomposting. Uh, so it would be going down to teach uh, farmers and students uh, all about vermicomposting, how to set it up, how to do it, um, along with possibly, you know, using, I'm sure I would use my knowledge to teach them how to take advantage of soil microbes and do compost teas and things like that as well. Uh, yeah, it's supposed to be happening in July or August, and I'm hoping to hear about it today that there's supposed to be a final decision made today. So hoping to find out, hopefully it's good news, but I'd love a trip to Jamaica paid for. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be great. I don't want to pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I tell you what, let's, let's, uh, let's wrap it up. You can keep commenting. Um, this is going to be posted on YouTube. In fact, most people that watch this are probably going to end up watching it after the fact, but we're going to do, we do these, uh, uh, our, our schedule now is every Wednesday or every other Wednesday at 11 AM East coast time. And, uh, these are a lot of fun. I think we answer some, some pretty insightful questions that you guys have and learn a little bit ourselves. So, um, cool. Let's go ahead and sign off and we will hopefully see you guys again next week. Thanks for joining, everyone. All right. See ya.